Hi, good afternoon. Welcome. It's 101 Eastern and uh, welcome to Vision, a show about the trends, ideas, and disruptions changing the face of our democracy. The past two weeks have seen a nation rise up uh, in ways that we haven't seen for a long time in this country. And one of the key questions that we've been tackling on this show is, can our democratic systems meet the moment and channel this anger, this energy, uh, these new demands into change? And as we saw this week in the state of Georgia, this is a profoundly practical question in the COVID era. Exactly two weeks after the killing of George Floyd touched off an awakening in cities across the country, those eager to have their say in the state of Georgia had to wait in frustratingly long lines as new voting machines malfunctioned. So with that event as the backdrop, we're going to continue our discussion on how to manage uh, an election in a time of COVID and clearly in a time of immense change in the country uh, with two incredible guests, with Trevor Potter, who's the founder uh, and president of the Campaign Legal Center, and Ann Ravel, who is the director of the Project on Digital Disinformation at Maplight. And both are former members of the Federal Election Commission, which oversees campaign finance laws. We've got a lot to discuss given what's going on in the country right now, and we may go a little long today. So without further ado, please welcome Trevor Potter and Ann Ravel. Hi, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Sam. Oh, Ann, I think you're muted. Just a quick. All right, excellent. Well, I, so we could really only begin with one question, which is, what happened this week in Georgia? And can you, do you want to start and then we'll go to you, Trevor? Well, you know, obviously we know that there were really long lines that uh, people were voting after midnight. It took them seven, seven hours, some of them, and to be in line, which is outrageous. Um, I think that the issue of whether or not the machines malfunctioned is interesting because from what I understand it is that the machines actually just were overly complicated and nobody knew how to make them function. And they were, the poll workers weren't trained. The people who were there to vote couldn't utilize them. Sometimes the poll workers, I read somewhere, they put in the cards upside down and inappropriately. Um, so it was a systemic problem. And of course there were more voters um, at the polls because a lot of their mail-in ballots didn't arrive or they arrived late and didn't have the right language on them. I mean, all kinds of problems that created longer lines. And, and it's pretty, pretty scandalous for people to have to wait in line that long, but they did it, which is a testament to the <laughs> interest that people have in wanting to have their voices heard. Right, but we don't want we don't want voting to be a decathlon. <laughs> Why you yeah. be able to to be able to, even if you're lazy and indolent? We want you to be able to to vote. Trevor, what did you see go wrong in Georgia? Well, there is a basic rule in election administration which was violated here, and everybody knew it was violated. And that is, you don't introduce new machinery and new systems in the middle of an election year, because you want poll workers who are by and large older and used to whatever they've been doing to be able to do it without a lot of complexity and thought. And so when Georgia went to these new systems, which were highly controversial, they made the, the right decision to have a paper trail, which I think was vital so that if the machines broke and people had voted, you'd at least know on paper how they voted. But they introduced these with very little training, uh, partly undoubtedly because of the virus and the fact that it wasn't easy to train people for the last three months. Uh, but they put these new machines in, and as Ann says, uh, I, some of them may have malfunctioned. Sometimes the poll workers may not have known what to do with them. But the end result is you had 10 machines in some places with only one working. And that led to the next problem, which is they had not expected this, understandably, so they didn't have backup ballots. Uh, there wasn't a way when the machines were down to simply hand people paper ballots. Furthermore, there were a number of people who had requested absentee ballots, had not received them, uh, and therefore came to the polling place. So they were listed as having had an absentee ballot, and they were told they couldn't vote, and they said, yes, but I'm here because I didn't get my ballot. So it was a um, snowballing of problems, 
what I think is worth noting is that these problems tended to be in the heavily populated urban areas. Uh, and, and I don't believe that's a conspiracy, but that's the reality of life. You have more voters there, and there tend to be, therefore, more voters per polling place in a city than there are way out in the countryside. So the reports are that maybe people waited 20 minutes in the countryside and eventually they, they went in and voted. In the city, we have reports of waiting seven hours. And so that has led to charges uh, that this is simply a system designed to make it harder for urban residents and therefore minorities and blacks in particular to vote because they comprise a much larger percentage of the people waiting to vote in these in these cities. And, and that undermines uh, faith in our election system at, at a terrible time when people are focused on systemic racism anyway. So let's go deeper on that issue, because I think there, you know, even, you know, two weeks ago uh, on this show, we had Spencer Overton from the Joint Center and Arturo Vargas from Naleo. And, you know, they pointed to that, right, that in that, that there's a huge inequity layer of the onion uh, when it, with regard to COVID in particular, because all of the challenges of having to manage an election by mail, all of the challenges of having to get, make sure that polling places can be you know, resilient and medically safe are compounded uh, in, in under-resourced areas. And then of course, we've got this other layer of the onion, which is you know, to what extent are these, is this a function of sort of longstanding resource disparities um, to, to so many neighborhoods and communities um, that where, 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 um, black Americans live, where brown Americans live. So, I mean, and what, you know, what, how much of this is, is how much of the kind of inequity access question has to do with the unique challenges of COVID and how much of it has to do with what's, what's built into our system? Well, and, and I think that's a really central question here because one of the other things that we didn't mention yet is that a lot of the, the mail-in ballots um, in Georgia were not stamped. And of course, if, if it's going to be in a minority low-income community, the, in order to have more access, you would expect, and most of the election experts say, that it's important for them to be stamped, and they were not. And even Stacey Abrams, who wanted to vote by mail, couldn't because her, um, the, it was, uh, closed and you couldn't open it. And so, I mean, there were a lot of things that were wrong. But with regard to your question, I think it's very interesting to think about what voter suppression really is. Um, while we have a long history of voter suppression in this country that is um, a clearly purposeful, um, the other part of it is that election officials can make decisions about who can vote easily and who can't. That's their role. And typically, you would think that they would do it equally across both, especially those communities that are more populous, such as the cities, where there are more Latinos and more African Americans. Um, but that isn't the what happened here. And so really, the issue of voter suppression is um, how they affect uh, voters' desire and ability to be able to vote. And so I, I think in some ways this is purposeful because yes, there were unexpected things that happened regarding uh, COVID, but also you always know where the majority or can try to predict where the majority of ballots are going to come in. And in particular, in a situation like this, where they were also not clear about how to vote um, through vote by mail. And we know statistically, and people have generally said that African American and Latino voters often don't feel comfortable voting by mail and would much prefer to be in a voting location. So preparing for that is the job of the election officials. And admittedly, there are things that happened that perhaps they weren't um, prepared for and wasn't purposeful, but I think there's certainly an element of that here. 
So Trevor, if, if you were, you know, if, you know, you do advise election officials, you know, if you're advising election officials who at least want to be purposeful in enabling as many people to vote as possible, you know, what are some of the administrative issues that you would really be focused on right now, what, either upstream, you know, in terms of what we need to get help, how we help people to vote by mail or downstream, like on polling, you know, on election day, what, what do we need to be doing really intentionally if the goal is to enable as many people to, as possible who want to vote to vote? And to vote safely, which yeah. has been an issue in these primaries this spring. Uh, and if it's right, there's going to be a second wave, may well be uh, an issue for a lot of people in, in November. Uh, the first thing is to have available to voters a range of ways to vote. Now, there are four states, as you probably know, in the U.S., that basically vote by mail. They, every voter, registered voter, gets a ballot. Uh, they fill it out. They can either put it back in the mail or uh, they can put it in a um, lockbox uh, at specific locations. Those states have been doing that now for a while. They had a transition of four or five years to get to the place where people understood it and it worked smoothly. And, and that seems to have gone well. But it is difficult to take that system and suddenly impose it on a state where people aren't used to using it, the post office isn't used to it, the election officials aren't used to it, they haven't got the printer contracts, they don't have the machines that are new and speedy to count those ballots. And yet that is what is going to happen in a lot of states because people are concerned about voting in a crowd. And we saw that in these primary states like Wisconsin, uh, which traditionally had had 10% uh, people vote by mail suddenly had 50 and 60 percent voting by mail. So states need to be prepared for two different things at once. One is a wave of requests for absentee ballots and getting them out in time and educating the voting public now that they need to ask for them in advance and allow enough time to get them. If you ask for them uh, and get it on the Saturday before the election, it may not get back in time. There are many states that require that the vote must be, the ballot must be received by election day or on election day. So the voter education needs to be done now. Some states are doing this really well. They're sending postcards out to people saying, it's easy to vote absentee, how, here is how you do it. Other states are proposing to send every registered voter an application for an absentee ballot. But that's only one piece of it, because as Anne, I think, absolutely correctly said, there are a number of communities that for one reason or another are not going to find absentee voting by mail their preferred choice. People may not have a good mailbox. They may have a history of getting their mail stolen. Uh, they may live in a place where there's a common mailbox and they're worried about that. Um, they may have uh, site issues and, and need help voting. Uh, so for all of those, you're going to have to have enough in-person voting places. And so states need now to be focusing on who is it who's going to staff those places. One of the things that happened in Georgia and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania is that a large number of their traditional poll workers who are tend to be elderly because that's a great responsible job for retired people who have the time and can spend the whole day, those people did not turn up in significant numbers for health reasons out of out of concern. So they closed polling places or were understaffed because they didn't have the, the poll workers. So starting now, uh, if it's likely that college students are going to be at home, train college students, uh, look for people who can take the day off and work the polls so that you have a backup group uh, for November. And then the final piece coming out of Georgia is be prepared for problems and have enough backup paper ballots. Uh, I mean, not every state is going to have a brand new voter system uh, on their biggest primary day, uh, but states have problems, there are electrical issues and so forth, and you need to have enough paper backup ballots handy. And what would, would you add yeah. to or quibble with anything on that list? I would. I mean, I think not only backup ballots, which obviously they, they have to have, but all kinds of equipment. I mean, for example, they should have the voter registration rolls in paper so that there's clearly going to be access to all of those things, um, as well as 
I mean, in my view, part of what happened in Georgia was the failure to train. And yes, of course, COVID may have had some influence on that, but it's very important to train the poll workers. And obviously they could do a Zoom just like this. Uh, so with young people, because they're not going to have the older uh, poll workers. So, I mean, those are things that I think are really important. But the other um, factor that we didn't talk about that I think is really important to do, given the situation now with more mail-in balloting and, and COVID, would be to have the polls in, in all locations, all kinds of locations, both the drop-offs as well as the polling spots, as well, you know, as well as earlier voting, it should all be done earlier. They, they should be open more than just one day. They should be open for a week in order to not only have them uh, more accessible to people, but to allow people uh, later to, to actually uh, count that vote in a way that is more expeditious than what's going to happen in this election in 2020. So I want to ask a few questions about um, some of the perceptual issues that come along with elections. I mean, one of the reasons we were really excited you both were able, a couple of reasons we were really excited you were able to join the show. I think one is you guys have, you've, you've helped to oversee election policy in different administrations and times. Uh, and I think it's easy to think about where we are in a vac. It's natural to think about where we are in a vacuum versus as part of a continuum of debate about the right way to hold elections. But also because, um, you know, you, as particularly at the Federal Election Commission, you both have, have had to be at that bridge point where arcane matters of policy come together with really fundamental value questions about who has a voice and how that voice gets expressed. And... Um, and so one of the questions I wanted to ask about everything you all just described is, you know, what are the, what are the, what are the partisan dimensions of this debate and how are they helping or hurting? It's, it seems to me the reality is we, we don't seem to have, um, we may have bipartisan consensus that everyone ought to have the right to vote. I think there's, uh, there's some debate about that. Some people don't think we have bipartisan consensus about that, but we clearly don't seem to have bipartisan consensus about um, the validity of mail-in voting. It doesn't seem we have bipartisan consensus about the level of investment that will be required, at least at the national level. On the other hand, you know, at, you know, we hear over and over, and it comes up on this show, when you're, that for so many local election officials, they're just thinking about, hey, I'm a public servant, no matter what party I'm from, I'm a public servant trying to help people vote, and I'm doing everything I can to make that happen. There just seems to be this really deep juxtaposition between our national politics and the way so many folks on the front lines are thinking about this. So how do you come at this? Like we now have a political and policy question that we're facing. Can, are we going to be able to get ready for this election? Are we going to be able to make it as equitable as possible? How, where, where, do, what, where do you see the, the partisan shoals in the debate? Maybe Trevor, we'll start with you and then, and then Anne. Sure. I, 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 this should not be a partisan issue. And yet I have not seen election issues this polarized in my lifetime. Um, part of it is uh, President Trump's uh, loud and unrelenting attack on voting by mail, even though he votes by mail and his vice president does and his press secretary does. And he's really into the postal service, as we all know from the Amazon debate. <laughs> well, and, and that's, a, a, that's another uh, corollary issue here because the postal service is essential to voting by mail and he is threatening to shut it down. Yeah. Uh, and saying he will block the loan Congress has passed to it. And they've said they, they may have to shut down before the election, which is, is crazy in an election yeah. where uh, it's, it may not be safe to vote in person. I, I think you have to unpack this a little. The Republican Party historically has had a very strong uh, vote by mail program in, in a number of states. California's one, Arizona's one, Florida's one, where they identified Republican-leaning, registered Republican voters, um, and focused on older voters and went to them and said, you don't have to vote on election day. You can fill out an absentee ballot and you can vote at home and we'll get the ballot to you. Uh, we'll get the application to you and you can do it. And they would follow up, make sure people did vote. It's public record when ballots are returned. And as a result, 
they didn't have to worry about voter turnout for that group and they would what they would call bank those votes in advance. What's happened is the Democrats have figured out how to do that too. And in the last election, particularly in California, they had a huge absentee uh, voter program and Republicans were unpleasantly surprised by that. Uh, I think President Trump has made a calculation here that his voters are first of all, more rural and less urban. Um, and therefore they're gonna have an easier time voting anyway. They're gonna be at the moment less worried about the pandemic. Um, and they are probably, in his view, gonna vote no matter what. So he sees the threat that everyone else is going to be encouraged to vote and that they're gonna have votes in, in his scenario delivered to their doorstops, ballots delivered to their doorstops, uh, as the possibility of really increasing voter turnout uh, beyond his base uh, to, to uh, Democratic base and, and independence. And, and that's what he's objecting to. On the other hand, you have secretaries of state of both parties saying, look, as you've said, I'm a public servant. My job is to make sure that people can vote and vote safely. And so I want to provide a range of ways for them to do it. They don't see it as uh, stimulating the turnout of one party or another. I, I would add that every survey I've seen says that there is no partisan advantage to absentee voting, that it does not change the election numbers when people shift from in-person to absentee. And the reason is that pretty much the same people still vote. Uh, it doesn't radically change the, the voting pool uh, and bring in lots of people who hadn't voted before. Uh, it might be good for democracy if we had higher levels of participation, but merely shifting from voting in person to voting at home doesn't change that. Ann, your thoughts on the partisan? Yeah, um, well, first off, I, I agree with Trevor for sure that um, it does not actually have an impact on the vote, whether you are, uh, when you're voting by mail. And Stanford recently did a study on that issue and said that there was no evidence whatsoever of that. Um, but I do think that, um, over the years, and I don't think this is the only year with Trump, that uh, voting and, and access to voting has been a partisan issue to some degree. Because I know, for example, um, in vote by mail in those states that do have the absentee ballots and votes, I mean, in some um, states, there are great impediments for people to be able to show that they can vote by absentee. And also in many states we know where there are in particular conservative or Republican um, secretaries of state, uh, some of the decisions that are made about um, looking at the signatures on absentee ballots um, has been politically motivated and have they have by large percentages uh, disqualified ballots from more low-income African-American and minority, other minority communities. So to, I, I disagree with Trevor a little bit in that um, there have been circumstances, and this is not all across the country, but it, there have been circumstances where those ballots have been uh, disqualified in really large numbers that essentially uh, give people um, no ability to vote whatsoever. And so I, I'm kind of uh, concerned about that problem because sure. we, know, we know that some states, for example, Oregon has both um, uh, Democrats and Republicans on a committee that will make decisions about whether those ballots are valid um, that, are, that are right in the uh, mail, mail ballots. Um, but other states are particularly partisan. Sam, could I just- Yeah, Trevor, it looks like you want to get in, go for it. Because Anne's absolutely right. I mean, a big part of CLC's work is fighting uh, partisan efforts across the country uh, to privilege the party in power in the legislature or holding the Secretary of State's office and make it harder for the other party to vote. We have seen that across the country. We've been fighting uh, voter ID issues where the Texas legislature wrote laws that made it easy for Republican 
uh, gun owners to vote and made it impossible for students yeah. in state universities to use their ID to vote, or Georgia last time where there was purging of the voter rolls, yeah. or North Dakota where they required a residence address of uh, uh, tribal members on reservation properties which don't have residential addresses. Right. They knew that. So this is an ongoing battle around the country, and it is you know, offensive, I think, that uh, the party in power, whichever party it is, would try to rig the rules to make it more difficult for the other side to vote, and, and particularly difficult here, where in a number of these southern states, when Republicans try to make it hard for Democrats to vote, which is what they will admit in the redistricting context, um, we're, we're, we are stacking the deck to elect more Republicans, what they say is, I, we don't want to elect Democrats, but this is in a state where Democrats have a racial identity and most Blacks are Democrats. So th there is a double whammy. They are not only going against the other party, but they are making it hard for minority communities to vote. And we see that time and again. They, they rig the rules to say we're no longer going to have voting on the Sunday before the election, because that was a day that traditionally Black churches would go to church and then souls would go to polls. So this is an ongoing problem. Anne is absolutely right about that. Uh, the, what, the distinction I was drawing is that we've never before had a president who tried to threaten the validity of right. the election and a key way to vote. So, let, so let's talk about that because, you know, one of the things that that we've seen this in polling, uh, you know, the, the, some research that we've done around people who, who don't vote. We did a big study of, of the 100 million Americans who chronically don't vote for president is, you know, there's, there's, there's like these compounding losses, right? So the person who loses the opportunity to vote on election day, you never get that right back for that iteration of that election as we know. Um, there's, a, there's, the, there's a party that maybe ought to, uh, a candidate who ought to have won who didn't, but, you know, even, but even if it doesn't swing the system, then there's this net effect, right? Which is that people are smart and they, and they know, and, and so they internalize this as in, into some sort of referendum on the reliability of our elections. A huge portion, we saw a huge portion of people who don't vote are, are worried their vote doesn't count. But more than that, they don't, even if that's not the reason they don't vote, they just don't believe in the system. They don't actually think that the election is, is providing uh, an accurate result. And then they, then, they, and then, they, then they take that a step further and raise real questions of the efficacy of their own voice in the democracy. And so, you know, we're getting questions already from our audience about, should we expect, you know, the result uh, on election day? And I'm just, can you help us think about that task, the legitimacy task, which is we're, we're going to do a huge mode shift. We're going to, it's probably going to mean that we don't get the result the day of the election. We've got a media establishment that will be reporting on the election that psychologically can't handle like the inability to call an election and will go crazy. You've got a president who's already raising questions. The incumbent president is already raising questions about the validity of the mode shift. What do we, what do we need to do to continue the, the real genius of this system, which is that we accept the results of these elections. That's the real genius of this, of this system. What, maybe, Anne, we'll start with you and then go to Trevor. How do we shore up yeah. the legitimacy? Can I um, deviate a slight bit Please, from yeah. that question? Because there's a, there's a real connection here with um, the rhetoric that is coming from the president about voting in, and about COVID. Um, and its relationship to um, the deep state or to uh, various other uh, things like COVID was really uh, done by the Democrats to uh, respond so that they could undo the election. And those are things that get uh, transmitted on the internet, on platforms. Um, and many of them, a lot of the disinformation about, about COVID as well as the connection to voting is palpable. It's clear that it's done for the purpose of, of political propaganda. In fact, there's recently been some uh, absolute false information about COVID and various other things on a African-American Facebook site that is devoted to voting issues. So this is a concerted effort done by 
mostly right wingers probably who are picking up on the language that's coming from the president and is using it to manipulate the vote. And, and I also think foreign actors, by the way, right? To just to create doubt. They, they don't care which candidate, it's this exact issue. They want you that, to doubt the validity of the Absolutely. Election. And the whole purpose of all of this is to d doubt the, the validity of the vote, to have lack of trust in our democratic institutions and, all, and governmental institutions, and also to assure that in some cases, people don't vote. I mean, it's almost, it's in 2016, that was quite clear. They actually told people not to vote, mostly in black communities. So these are all things that I think are, are a broader problem. Um, and I, the press, the mainstream press obviously has a really important role here to uh, debunk this information that's coming. Uh, so that people feel more confidence, because I think you're right. I mean, there's no question that historically, if people feel that they do not have trust in government, period, if they don't feel their voice counts, but also if they don't have trust in the way that the voting mechanisms are going to work, they're not going to vote. And that's truthfully, back to voter suppression, <laughs> that's, that's purpose, purposeful. So uh, Trevor, what do you, what, what can we do to build confidence? You know, we're, we're in June, it's not that long, but what, what do we do to build expectations and confidence before election day? Well, there are two things that I think are really important. The first is that the states need funding for what needs to be done. And Congress gave them 400 million, which is about 10% of the estimate of what they need. Uh, the house has proposed several billion uh, that's sitting in the Senate, as far as I can see, not moving at the moment. The quicker they get it, the better. They need it to print ballots. They need it to go out in states that haven't had a lot of absentee ballots. They need to go pay printers, and they need to put stamps on those envelopes to get them back. They need new machines to count those. They need money to train more workers. All the things we've been talking about at a time when they're in a budget crisis, and unlike the federal government, they can't just print money and lower interest rates. They actually have to have tax dollars, uh, which they're using to fight the pandemic and which they're not getting because of the pandemic. They need that money to go do all these things. So one is federal funding. The second is uh, we all, the press, individuals, voting officials, need to have a clear understanding that this is an election process. It is not turning a switch. Uh, we are in a, ironically sort of back to where we started as a country where it took several days for people to vote because they had to ride in and do it in, in uh, town centers. Uh, and then it took days to know who had won. Uh, and it took a while for that election result to reach the Capitol. And that's back where we are because we are stringing out the voting period and people are gonna vote by mail. Then the ballots are going to arrive and they're going to be literally tens of millions of ballots that have to be opened and counted in many cases, by law, that process can't even start until the polls are closed. In some states, they're saying you can start counting the morning of the election, but they don't want people to know in advance who's ahead. So they're saying you can't normally count until the polls are closed. The result of that is going to be, it is going to be a couple of days before the ballots are counted. And then of course, you have the question of, are there close races and are there recounts and so forth? So last time in, in 2000, as you recall, it took to the middle of December to get to the point where we knew who was going to be declared the winner in Florida. Uh, I hope it isn't that long this time, but it's going to be a couple days. And so uh, the, the idea that we're going to go to bed on election night, having seen total nationwide returns is, is just a fiction. It is not going to happen that way. It hasn't happened that way for the last two times, but the press has focused on where the count was and the assumption has been there were not enough absentee ballots to change it. This year, I think there are definitely going to be enough absentee ballots in a number of key states that we're going to have to wait and hear what the count on those ballots is. 
So I, that that brings me really to the last the question I want to leave on, which is the future. And I th- I think the way you the way you said it, uh, the way you sort of described what it used to be like, I think particularly for a lot of young Americans, you know, is sort of what they object to. Like while we were having this conversation, for all you know, I ordered five meals on Grubhub. You know, like it's just it's just that easy to do uh, to transact online for a lot of. Of, of what we do, including a lot of high stakes things we do, by the way, banking, et cetera, um, really high stakes, high security tasks. And I, and I fear, you know, a lot of young people, you know, when don't, don't want to be, don't want to, they're not reassured to know that there was a time that we, you know, someone on a horseback had to show up. They sort of think that's the, that's the problem. And, and, and are thinking that as we talk about using these really analog processes to be able to safely pull off uh, an election. So, Let's just, last question is really one about the future. Like how far away are we, and we're getting this from the audience too, like how far away are we from, you know, voting online or voting in, in ways that feel uh, contemporary with some of the other transactions we have? We'll start with you, Trevor, and then Anne will give you the last word. I have one word answer to that, which is anonymity. Uh-huh. That's the difference. Of course I can go bank online and I can order five things from Grubhub precisely because everybody knows I'm me, I've used my credit card data, I've given them the identification, I go to the bank, I've given them my mother's birth date. They know it's Trevor Potter doing this. With voting, the whole point is it's a secret ballot. They're not supposed to know it's me. And so it is very difficult to figure out how to design a system where I can vote digitally, electronically online and somehow separate that from my identity while guaranteeing that it's really a registered voter. Um, and so that's the, the difficulty. The threat, of course, is hacking. And you know, if your bank account gets hacked, your bank makes you whole. Someone uses your credit card, you say, that's not my charge. If your vote gets hacked, it's gone, it's done. And with the foreign uh, 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 fears we have of foreign interference or, or domestic, uh, turning over the voting system to uh, you know, somebody who can hire a good hacker and go in and change results or prevent me from voting or give somebody else extra votes is really a worry, which is why the old fashioned pen and paper is still the safest way, uh, offensive as that is to people who are used to operating totally digitally. And last word to you. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with Trevor on this one. Um, I, of course, here in Silicon Valley and people here say that there is still a lot of concern about voting online <clears throat> for that same reason, because of hacking. And in fact, I mean, even the voting machines that were used in Georgia, people were concerned about hacking uh, in the, for those machines. And so, and we know I mean, aside from what happened previously in um, 2016 with regard to some of the hacking, not not that we know about the voting machines because uh, there wasn't any auditing, so we have no way of knowing. But we know there's already been hacking of the Biden campaigns and the uh, um, Trump campaigns in this election by China and Iran, I think. And so hacking is a, a real concern that um, they would be able to either change the votes or change the voter registration in a way that would be problematic. So um, I think we're not there yet, but we should be. I think it's something that that is really important to do. Um, of course, then everybody needs uh, broadband access all over the country yeah. as well. <laughs> Yeah, at least in a mobile fashion. Well, um, for those of you who are really closely following these issues as the stakes get higher and higher, um, Anne and Trevor are both really good guides to what's going on and what's important. You can follow Trevor uh, on Twitter at, at the Trevor Potter, and you can follow Anne on Twitter uh, at Anne M. Uh, Ravel. Um, and as always, we'll send that information out to you uh, after the show. Uh, Anne and Trevor, thank you so much for joining us. Thank Thanks you. very much, Sam. This has been a great conversation. Thanks for having uh, us. Yeah. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, next Bye. week, uh, we will be uh, we'll be joined by Stephen Heinz, the president of the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation, uh, and Antonio Hernandez, who's the president of the California uh, Community Foundation and the former CEO of the Mexican American 
legal defense fund, MALDEF. They are serving on a, a major commission on the future of citizenship, and they'll be on the show to talk to us about the new demands and new opportunities for citizens in an era of intense change. Their commission is releasing findings today, and so we'll have an exclusive opportunity to, uh, to hear from them. Um, at a time that where this question of what are our responsibilities uh, as residents as citizens couldn't be more important. Uh, as a reminder, this website, uh, this episode will be on the website tomorrow, and you can see this episode and any episode uh, on demand at kf.org slash vision. I'd especially encourage you to check out a special non-live episode we did earlier this week with Vanita Gupta, the uh, president of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, talking about the protests that are happening across the country and what we can do to advance the cause of civil rights in this country. Uh, you can email us at vision at kf.org and visit us on Instagram at vision.kf. Please take the survey that's up on your screen now. As always, we'll end the show with music from Nick County, uh, Miami-based singer-songwriter. It's available on Spotify. Until next week, thanks for joining us.